Welcome to ICU Primary Prepcast. Hi, I'm Maddie. Hi, I'm Swapnil, and we are joined by our third host, Dr. Mike Clifford from Melbourne. Welcome, Mike. Good day, Swapnil and Maddie. How's life in Melbourne, Mike? It is beautiful. A lovely 20 degrees. Uh, the sun was out a little bit today. No rain. I didn't no. have to paddle my boat to work, unlike people in Sydney. Oh, the sun was out here today for once. It was actually a <laughs> nice day. Yeah, that's right. Were you right. releasing the doves to see if they could come back with some olive branches? Or <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I guess uh, let's begin with today's topic. So I guess we start with our clinical scenario and then walk through three different topics for today. So Maddie, do you want to kick off? Yeah, so today um, we're going to focus a bit on neuromuscular physiology and monitoring. So Mike, if we're thinking about in an ICU patient, we've got this 45-year-old gentleman who's come in with hypoxic respiratory failure secondary to a community-acquired pneumonia, ends up getting severe ARDS, is intubated and, and very difficult to ventilate. So we decide to paralyze him. Before that, can you talk to me a bit about what the physiology of the motor end plate and excitation contraction coupling? Yeah, sure, Maddie. So this is a, a reasonable component of the syllabus. It's a big component of the syllabus. And I guess some of that reflects historically how much work was done on muscle physiology in Melbourne, particularly 30 or 40 years ago, or even longer, probably in the 1970s. So we do seem to have a very big uh, component of, of muscle physiology. But having said that, we do often have to stop movement in patients, either because of um, shivering or because of too much movement, or we just want them flat, reduce oxygen consumption. And it's important to understand how that occurs and, and why that occurs. And the, the transmission of, of electrical activity from the nerve cell across the neuromuscular junction and into muscle is actually really very, it's very elegant and exciting. And some of the textbooks have become really beautiful to read. And there are some lovely videos that you can see online to actually watch it all happening in real time. But essentially, a action potential travels down the alpha motor nerve to the terminal bouton which is an expansion of the end of the nerve cell over an area of skeletal muscle. And with that depolarization, there's a small amount of calcium that, is, that, it, that enters, the, enters the cell. And that enables uh, the docking of vesicles into the, the foot process of that nerve. And those vesicles contain large amounts of acetylcholine. And different textbooks have different numbers, but a good number to remember is around about uh, 10,000. So there's about 10,000 molecules of ACH in one of those vesicles. And the tiny little protein projections on the outside of those vesicles connect to docking proteins on the foot plate. And then the, the, the membranes fuse and the ACH is released uh, into the synaptic cleft between the nerve and the muscle cell. So one, one vesicle, 10,000, is one quanta. And that ACH diffuses across into the grooves on the surface of the skeletal muscle. And those lovely little grooves have ridges. And on the ridges is where the nicotinic ACH receptors are concentrated. So it sort of optimizes the um, ACH for those receptors. And there's so much extra ACH released for a given amount of receptor that you're almost certainly going to have full activation of those receptors. So one, one, one vesicle will usually uh, yield a miniature end plate potential or a little rise in, in um, uh, depolarization of the muscle cell. And if you get enough of those quanta released from a full action potential, you'll flood that cleft and that will all transmit across to the uh, skeletal muscle and occupy more than enough receptors to bind to the ACH receptor. And you'll have two, AC, two acetylcholine molecules per receptor and that will open up the central pore of that ionic receptor and allow cations to flood into the skeletal muscle. And that's when things get really exciting because suddenly the skeletal muscle has a, a depolarization towards threshold and that releases um, calcium, particularly from something called the T-tubule, which is actually a, it's, it's the outside membrane that's sort of punched down in to the center of the cell. It's, it's not in the cell. It's just an invagination of the, of the external membrane. If, if you can imagine 
pushing your hand into a sock. You've pushed the sock down, but you haven't gone through the sock. So it's like a little tubule hanging into the center of the cell. And release of calcium from there goes into the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that little bit of calcium suddenly causes a flood of new calcium channels, the calcium-related calcium release of more calcium. And that calcium then drifts over to the contractile element of skeletal muscle and starts to induce changes. So the, the molecules that we're talking about there, there are the, the actin and the myosin, the actin being these thin uh, double helix-related proteins that are bound within the, in the centre of the, of, the, of the skeletal muscle. And then the myosin is another much, more, much larger protein that has similarly coiled proteins with heads that are at one end, and there's usually six actin to one myosin. So they're sort of staggered around the outside of these proteins and they interdigitate. And the concept is something called the sliding filament hypothesis. And what happens is that the myosin stays stationary, but the actin, which is bound at one end to a, a Z-line, moves towards itself. So there's really there's been some lovely work detailing exactly how it happens, but essentially you've got these little docking stations, the calcium floods in, and the calcium binds to the part of the tropa troponin complex, which is sitting attached to the tropomycin, which is a protein that's wrapped around the actin. The calcium filters in and binds to the troponin C molecule, and that causes a shift in the sort of state of the troponin, and the whole thing sort of lifts up. And as it lifts up, it exposes a site for the myosin heads to now bind to the actin. And in the presence of ATP being phosphorylate, losing a, a phosphate molecule and becoming ADP, that head shifts off and then drifts backwards up the actin and then binds to a new site that's now exposed because of the presence of the calcium on the troponin. And then when the ADP dissociates, you have a power stroke on that little head of myosin. So the whole thing is like little fingers that crawl along the um, actin and the myosin just stays in the middle and the actin gets pulled along by these little fingers and moves in towards the centre. So you've got this lovely interdigitation, like fingers moving together in your hands um, as a result of that ATP consumption. Now, when the, when the power strokes finish and there's no more ATP, the calcium gets pumped back out of the cell and the whole thing um, relaxes back to, to where it was. So it's, a, it's, it's an incredibly elegant um, system. And uh, it, it's amazing to look at some of the videos that have been made of this process to get an understanding of exactly uh, what's going on. But that's essentially what enables skeletal muscle to contract. And you can see how there's a, a heavy dependency on calcium availability and use. And there's also a lot of ATP consumption that goes on. So it's a very energetic process and it generates a lot of heat. That's pretty good. So, um, so if, we, if we want to prevent that from happening, if we want to stop muscle contraction or we want to reduce heat production, um, there are drugs available to us to do that. So, Maddie, can you tell me um, what are some of the drugs that we use to inhibit uh, skeletal muscle contraction? Uh, so there are neuromuscular blockades, um, which are so paralytic agents that we normally use to inhibit this contraction, and they can be like depolarizing or non-depolarizing agents. I guess some of the common ones we use, things like rocuronium is probably the commonest one in ICU, but traditionally drugs such as succimethonia have been used, and in terms of infusions, you might see people on cisatracurium infusions throughout the intensive care unit. Okay. Why would you use one rather than the other? Uh, so I think um, it, it's dependent on some of the pharmacological characteristics of it. So it depends on looking at the patient's physiology and their um, and what we're trying to achieve. So with brief neuromuscular blockade, sometimes um, if we don't, if we want a quick onset and offset, say for intubation, people might use um, rocuronium or succimethonium. So succimethonium has a quicker onset about of about 30 to 60 seconds um, and rock is kind of intermediate of one to two minutes and looking at the duration so sucks is quite quick like short acting can last between 10 to 30 minutes whereas rock is a bit longer of 30 to 50 minutes um, and if we're thinking about infusions we want something with 
potentially like a quicker onset and offset and looking at the adverse effects of these drugs. So for example, if patients have organ failure, like renal failure or hepatic failure, it'd be important to look at how these drugs are metabolized and some of the adverse effects and profiles of it. So for example, cis atricurium is metabolism is largely independent of things like hepatic function and it undergoes Hoffman elimination. So which means it isn't reliant on organ function. So this can be a good thing in ICU patients who often have multi-organ impairment. So what's the dose of cisatricurium to use? The dose of for for cisatricurium um, intubating doses are generally 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. And then it's given as an infusion to maintain paralysis, but I'm not sure about the dose for infusion rates. Mm. And why wouldn't, why wouldn't you infuse, say, rocuronium? Uh, so rocuronium can be used as sometimes, but it's usually used as bolus doses, but generally it has, yeah, I'm not actually sure. So it has, it has like a three compartment model of distribution. So it has a rapid distribution half-life and then, a, and then lower distribution as it goes into the, the less perfused tissues. So it's yeah. not generally used as an infusion, but rather needs bolus doses. And generally, if you give a bigger induction dose, it needs lo- lower doses for subsequent maintenance of um, neuromuscular blockade. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm asking a question that's a bit unfair because it was before you were born, Maddie. But in the olden days, when we used to run becuronium infusions, we, we, they've sort of gone out of fashion now. Apart from the organ dependence on the, what some of the other problems with long-term IV aminosteroid infusions were. Uh, no, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. You are entirely associated with ICU myopathy and neuromyopathy because of the steroid nature of the molecule, particularly when given in association with other corticosteroids. So there used to be a group of patients, particularly asthmatics in the olden days, that we used to paralyze and ventilate till their asthma got better. And then we turn everything off and they, they wouldn't move. And one of the problems was that they developed a a neuromyopathy related to the high dose aminosteroid infusion, but these days it, um, it's much less common, particularly when you're using um, intravenous cisatricurium. You mentioned succinothonium, so why why would people use succinothonium? Um, so I think part of it is 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 historical and familiarity. Um, yeah. So it is a drug that's been freely available and. And people have quite a lot of experience using it. It also pr- produces quite rapid paralysis of skeletal muscles. I mentioned quick, quick onset. So this is important in, especially in intensive sit- care situations where, where we're usually doing an RSI. And it's much shorter acting um, compared, more shorter acting compared to a lot of the other paralytic agents. So um, that can also be important if we're trying to, um, uh, to avoid pr- prolonged paralysis. The other thing is it, it has, um, it's rapidly metabolized by pseudocholinesterase, but this metabolism can be prolonged in patients who do have um, liver disease. And the, I guess the, the adverse effects are something that has de- like taken people away from the use of succinothonium. So it has effects on multiple organs. So cardiovascular, it can cause bradycardia and arrhythmias. In a neurological adverse effects include raised intraocular pressure um, and gastrointestinal, it can cause increased gastric pressure. And from a metabolic perspective, it can cause hyperkalemia. Um, and this is particularly important in patients who have things like um, severe trauma, prolonged immobilization, muscular dystrophy, or severe burns. And from an immune perspective, it can cause anaphylaxis and hypersensitivity reactions. And other effects include things like myalgia. Um, so some patients are very sore after, for example, operations for which they've had a succinothonium induction. And it can cause things like malignant hypothermia and massitus spasm as well. Yeah, I mean, the only real indication for succinothonium these days is as a drug to talk about the side effects. Yeah, so, that's um, it. <laughs> I haven't I haven't used succinothonium for over ten years, and but it, we still talk about it as if it's used every day. And I think that's yeah. basically to to have to give candidates something to talk about. I think it has much more interesting effects than a lot of the other neuromuscular blockade <laughs> agents. Um, but that's these right. days, even though we keep saying traditionally it has like quite a quick um, onset of action, if you give high dose rock, the yep. onset's pretty good. It can be you know sixty to ninety seconds. Um, if you give like yeah, one point five milligrams per kilo. Yep, yep. And you can reverse rock your own in very quickly these days too, can't you? What do you, what do you use to do that? So you can give Sigamidex. Yep. 
Can you tell me anything about Sagamidex? Yeah, so Sagamidex is a selective um, um, relaxant binding agent. Um, so it can be used for the reversal of ROC or VEC. Um, and it forms a tight water soluble complex with these drugs. Um, so this favours the movement of the drug from the neuromuscular junction into the plasma um, and that thus um, stops them having um, ongoing uh, effects. It, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty uh, effective drug, but I think what initially stopped it being used was it was quite expensive, but now it's becoming more freely available and it's um, eliminated unchanged by the kidneys. So it has, it's um, a pretty safe drug, but some adverse effects include hypersensitivity reactions, bradycardia, and randomly can also prolong um, some of the coagulation um, tests, such as an APTT and the INR. Are there any other um, specific precautions to its use that you need to remember? Because they're quite, they're a little bit idiosyncratic. Um... I guess, I mean, if you're reversing someone and then you need to, to um, paralyse them again. Um, right, okay, yeah. Going action. So sometimes um, you might need to choose a different drug, such as, for example, succimethonium and, or, or yeah. um, a non-steroidal drug, uh, mm. depo- uh, relaxant. Um, but I don't know what other idiosyncratic reactions. I think there's a couple of case reports out there of people being given um, flucloxacillin within a few hours that have, cause displacement of the rock uranium from the molecule. So one of the relative contraindications is the use of flucloxacillin within a few hours of being given Sagamidex, because if you haven't cleared it through your kidneys, you can be re-paralysed. But that's pretty fine print stuff. Did you want to ask Swapnil about um, how we're going to monitor your paralysed Oh, patient? yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Swapnil, now we've paralysed this agent. We end up choosing... Um, Rock uranium initially, and then was they, they were started on a cis atricurium infusion. Um, how are you going to monitor this patient's um, per, ongoing paralysis? Yeah, that's a good question, Maddie. So obviously, it's important to assess the degree of uh, neuromuscular block, and you, we can do that by applying the supra maximal stimulus to a peripheral nerve, and then measuring the associated muscular response. And Mike talked about the neurophysiology uh, of this uh, um, whole unit uh, as such. So typically one nerve fiber will innervate between five to 2000 muscle fibers and the nerve chosen to be stimulated must then fulfill certain number of criteria before we apply this stimuli. The first one is it must have a motor element. Um, the second one is um, it must be close to the skin. And the third one that is the contraction in the muscle or the muscle group which that nerve supplies must be visible or accessible to evoked response monitoring. And that's why often we see in intensive care unit, we choose the ulnar nerve and apply uh, the piezoelectric crystal or neuromuscular monitoring uh, around the thumb and uh, index finger, and then stimulate the ulnar nerve and then see the res- visible response. Now, in order to stimulate the nerve, an electrical current will need to be applied. The current is usually applied by a transcutaneous uh, method using the e- ECG electrodes. Then obviously, the generating an action potential in all of the nerve fibers in the motor nerve will require a current of sufficient magnitude and duration. So most of the nerve simulators that are available, they will apply the current for roughly about around 0.1 to 0.3 millisecond, which is more than adequate. Now, what what does kind of ideal nerve stimulator constitute? So it basically possesses certain basic properties, which include, first of all, it should be battery operated because you don't want to kind of plug in and uh, operate with the electricity. So it has to be battery operated. Second is it uh, should have ability to deliver a constant current uh, up to a maximum of 80 milliamps. And this is uh, preferable to a nerve stimulator that can only deliver a constant voltage. Because the current magnitude is the factor that determines whether the nerve depolarizes or not. And that's the nerve stimulator should be able to apply different magnitudes of current. Now, if you look at the Ohm's law, which basically says voltage is equal to current multiplied by resistance. Now, because we are applying the different current, the resistance will also change. And that, that is based on your skin resistance. And usually the factors such as skin temperature, adequacy of electrode application and disease state, for example, diabetic mellitus or chronic renal failure, anything with fluid overload will obviously increase the skin resistance and, and obviously the neuromuscular monitoring might not be accurate. So some of the factors that impact neuromuscular monitoring uh, based on that Ohm's equation uh, about the patterns of nerve stimulation. Now, usually there are various patterns. The first one is the single switch stimulation. 
in this case, we usually um, apply a single square wave supramaximal stimulus to peripheral nerve for a period of about 0.2 millisecond. And that is applied at a regular interval. And then the evoked response is observed. The twitch response will be only depressed when a neuromuscular blocking agent occupies more than 75% of postsynaptic nicotinic receptors. And the twitch depression needs to be more than 90% in order to provide a good conditions for any surgery. So I guess the most useful time to apply the single twitch pattern of nerve stimulation is at the onset of the neuromuscular blockade. I guess uh, the onset and recovery from depolarizing and non-depolarizing block will have a similar pattern. The only thing that they will differ in their time scale. So for example, succinyl choline, as you mentioned, will achieve the blockade quickly compared to non-depolarizing agents. So the single twitch stimulus will look like that there is a significant drop in twitch height or depression with succinyl choline very quickly compared to prolonged drop uh, with regards to non-depolarizing muscle agents. But obviously, this is not useful for ongoing monitoring of neuromuscular blockade because once you give depolarizing or non-depolarizing, the, the actual trace will look the same because there won't be any, any response to single twitch after once you achieve the neuromuscular blockade. So in order to monitor ongoing adequacy of a neuromuscular blockade, what we normally use in ICU is called a strain of force stimulation or TOF. Now, the principle was to produce a pattern of stimulation that did not require the comparison of evoked response to a controlled response. So that is another drawback of single twitch that you need to have a controlled response first, and then you can compare the application with that controlled response. While train of four, you don't need control because the first response acts as a control, and then you monitor the height of the subsequent responses. That's why it's very useful. The pattern involved stimulating the ulnar nerve with a soft uh, supramaximal twitch stimuli with a frequency of around 2 hertz. That is, we apply four stimuli, each separated by 0.5 seconds. And then the TOF was then repeated every 10 seconds. That means the train frequency is usually 0.1 hertz. Now, when you observe, then obviously you observe the height of the first response, that is T1. And then subsequently, you observe the, the twitch height up to fourth response, so T1, T2, T3, and T4. And then you calculate what you call a TOF ratio, which is the comparison of the height of the first response, T1, to fourth response, which is T4. So you've mentioned that um, with trainer four, you're looking at the different ratios between the first twitch and then the fourth, and the height, of height difference. Can you tell me what the difference between depolarizing and non-depolarizing um, neuromuscular blockers? So let's talk about, first of all, non-depolarizing agents. So when the non-depolarizing agent, such as vacronium, is given, a typical pattern is reduction in amplitude of evoked responses with T4 is affected first, then T3, followed by T2, and then T1. And this decrement in twitch height is known as fade. As the non-depolarizing block becomes more intense, the T4 disappears completely. So then instead of count of four, you see count of three, two, one or zero. And that's why we say, what is a TOF count? Whenever there's a TOF count of zero or one, that means obviously patient is paralyzed quite adequately. And obviously with the recovery, reverse is true. So when you start seeing more twitch appearing, so that T1, T2, T3, T4, all four counts are present, that means patient has been recovered from the neuromuscular blockade. Now, the other important thing that we also look when you monitor the TOF is the, the T4 to T1 ratio, as I mentioned, because and whenever the TOF ratio is less than 0.7, so ratio of height of T4 response to T1 response is less than 0.7, that is the probably the indication of adequate reversal. So anything more than 0.7, that means patient is adequately reversed. That means patient should have adequate handhold strength or the head hold strength. Nowadays, we want TOF ratio of at least 0.9 to be able to extubate the patient with, with the confidence that this patient will not require reintubation. Coming back to your question about what's the difference between depolarizing and non-depolarizing. So when you are looking at succamethonium, for example, which causes depolarizing a neuromuscular block, during the onset of depolarizing block, each of the four twitches, they decrease equally in size and there is no fade. So that's the main difference. For example, Mike might ask, why then don't you give succamethonium infusion? So what will happen? So if you keep giving succamethonium infusion, then you might develop what you call as phase two block, 
in which then you start seeing the fade and that mimics almost like a, what happens with non depolarizing agents. So that's, that's important to understand the phase one block and phase two block. Um, now something what we can, there are other different types of stimuli, which we can think about or observe is one is tetanic stimulation and the post tetanic count and also the double burst stimulation. So I guess probably we don't need to go in depth of each of them, but usually these um, counts are uh, they are observed mainly in the anesthetic setting, observe how much residual neuromuscular blockade that patient has. So that's probably beyond the scope of ICU primary, I guess. And just to add some more information around what are the other methods of monitoring neuromuscular blockage. So apart from train of four using the piezoelectric crystal, uh, there are other uh, methods of ev- monitoring the evoked muscle responses include mechanomyography, which is a measurement of evoked muscle tension, then electromyography, which is a recording of a compound action potential that occurs during the muscular contraction, and then acceleromyography, which is uh, basically a principle similar to mechanomyography. However, instead of measuring the force of contraction directly, we measure the acceleration of contracting muscle. And that's, that's the kind of difference. So there are the kind of different ways of measuring your neuromuscular blockade. For One the- thing I do with almost all of my trainees, and now they run away screaming, but I, I, I actually put a trainer four monitor on them. And I don't crank it all the way up to 60 to start with. I started at 10, but I let them feel what a trainer four feels like and show them the what the normal response is over the ulnar nerve and how you get movement of the thumb and various other things. And I remind them that, you know, if you're going to use this on a patient, and certainly if you're going to use a higher dose, like a a 50 or 60 milliamp stimulus, then you need to make sure that they're appropriately sedated or given some analgesia because it uh, it is quite uncomfortable. I remember the last time I did it, I um I did a post tetanic stimulus and on myself and I'd forgot to turn the voltage down and uh <laughs> I let out this little squeal. So it wasn't one of my finer moments, but I do try and <laughs> use these devices on the registrars to, so that they've got a, um, a bit of a muscle memory for these, um, why we do these things and how they work. No wonder nobody wants to train at Royal. <laughs> yes, right. Having said that, we are coming to the last part of this podcast, which is going to be the Maddie's moment <laughs> and taking all the craze away from Mike. Um, so. so before you do that, I'll give you a fun, a fun fact on um, succinamethonium. So we talk about succinamethonium and the risk of hyperkalemia. And I remember asking people, when, when, do, when does the risk begin? And people will tell you different things. Um, some people will say that, you know, it's a problem after two days, problem after a day, problem after a few hours. I mean, if you go back to the original paper looking at uh, when you get a hyperkalemic response, the the original studies were done in the case reports were patients in the Vietnam War and they had one of the patients was a, a Vietnam American soldier who'd been injured by a grenade and had burns. And when they gave him succinamethonium to do his burns dressings, he arrested. And then they they thought that was a bit unusual and they heard had heard case reports of hyperkalemia. So they they connected up an ECG and they gave him sucks the next day for his burns dressing and the same thing happened and they measured his potassium and it had gone skyrocketing. And that led to a, a long um, uh, protracted looking around for when these occurred. And, and in the case reports published after that, there, there were no cases of VF and death before about nine days. And there was no cases of significant hyperkalemic rises causing ECG changes for about seven days. So you've certainly got a few days of using succinamethonium, even in uh, bad burns, before the risk is uh, significant. Now, that's not to say you should test it, and we've got better drugs that are available now. But if you've got a patient who's allergic to aminosteroids or is allergic to um, uh, benzoylquinolonians for whatever reason, you can use succinamethonium if you use a reduced dose, and as long as you're in that first week, you'll probably be safe. Because if you actually measure the blood level of potassium in patients who are normal, um, the, the 95% confidence intervals around the, the rise of potassium is up to two. So a person who sits with a potassium of four can have a potassium of six uh, after their succinamethonium, even if they're completely normal. So um, there's a fair bit of uh, safety margin around succinamethonium. Not that I'm suggesting that we use it, but uh, it, it is, it's a, an interesting drug to look back historically because there's a lot of case reports and stuff written about. Yeah, absolutely. So Maddie, over to you. Or you're another victory lap. Well, we'll see. But okay, so uh, this is on theme. Um, 
what does the victor of a muscle loss competition receive? A trophy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you did it, Mike. I was very proud of that one. <laughs> that was a very surprising result. Um, that Mike managed to get score yeah, point there. Means. Well done, Mike. You're getting better, better and better off each month. At least you scored some wins. So that's good. That's a good start. So thanks, folks. Thanks for listening to this podcast. Thanks, Maddie, and thanks, Mike. So we'll be back in month's time with another episode. So till then, goodbye and have a nice time. See you later, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening. See you next time.